when I first looked at this, talking about being more than a conqueror, I was tempted to just jump right to the end of the chapter and really just uh, look at that with you. But I, as I was reading it, there was just no way I could skip through the first part of it to get to the second part because it's the first part that is the foundation to helping us see and glory in Jesus in the second part. So what we're going to do is we're going to work our way through the whole chapter, but it's the first two thirds of the chapter is really just, I'm going to read it and, and it's going to be um, just giving you a, uh, a synopsis of what's going on so that it lays the groundwork for where we're going to be. Um, so, Hey, I see my sister, Carol on there. If you guys want to say hello, she's the oldest of the Smith family. That doesn't make her old, just the oldest of all of our siblings. And she has kind of become the glue in a sense that holds uh, our family together. So, hey, Carol, it's so wonderful to see you there. So here's the first question. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing your answers on this. The first question is this. What does it mean to be a conqueror. What does it mean to be a conqueror? How would you, what words would you use to um, maybe that are synonymous with conqueror? What does a conqueror look like? Um, so yeah, what is a, a conqueror? What does it mean to be a conqueror? Yeah, look at that, I mean, it's, it's a powerful word, right? I'm looking at that word and I'm like, that, I want to be a conqueror. I want to be one who, who, uh, who, who conquers, right? I don't wanna be the one who is conquered. Do you? I don't wanna be the one that's conquered. I wanna be a conqueror. So uh, my question is, what is, what is a conqueror? Maybe you could give me just uh, some answers there. What does it mean to be a conqueror? Yeah, Kathy, thanks. One who's victorious over something or someone. Yep, <clears throat> others. What, is it, what does it mean to be uh, a conqueror? Yeah, look at that, that's good answers. A conqueror, now you don't wanna be the, the one who is conquered, right? Uh, I don't. Yeah, those are, are excellent. So is there a way in which, let me just, really kind of um, narrow it right in for our season and really this moment that we're in right now with the, with the coronavirus. Um, what does it mean? How can we be a conqueror in this unprecedented season? Look at the things that, now, so my encouragement is look back and look at some of the responses, overcomer, a person who takes over something or someone, someone who dominates with authority, one who's victorious. Those are great answers. Okay, how does that look in this as a believer, as, as a church? How do, how, is there a way in which we can be a conqueror? How do we do that in this? Because the scriptures in, right, it says that we are more than conquerors. We, we'll get to that. But, what does it look like in this moment? I'm really exciting, excited to hear some of your responses in that because this is where we've been moving over these Wednesday nights. We've kind of been building and trying to see what God would have us do, where he would have us move, how he'll have us operate, uh, from what place and posture should we move forward when we have the opportunity to open up again. How should we um, approach ministry? How should we approach our community? How should we approach our neighbors, our loved ones, as, as a conqueror in this season? What, so there's my question for us to be grappling with now. Yeah, so what does it look like for the church to be a conqueror in this season? I think that's a little bit harder to articulate, uh, but I, I think God is going to show us some really neat things. Uh, I'm loving the answers. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you're looking at the comments, I hope, as well. 
um, that it's going to strengthen our mission. It's not diminishing it. We're, we're, we're going to overcome. We're going to not let fear <clears throat> of the unknown override our normal lives. And those are good. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Um, I'm wondering how God will have us move as a body, as a church. How will God move the church, you know, big C, the, the, the bride of Christ in the world in this time? So let's look at Romans chapter 8. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, again, I'm going to read the whole chapter, not all at once, but I, I think it's so incredible. I'm going to read a chunk and then just say a couple things and ask a couple questions, but I really want to move pretty quickly. I don't want to get, um, I hate to use the word bogged down, but I don't want to get bogged down too much in the first part because, but I don't want to just skip over it either because it really lays the foundation for everything that we're going to see later. So here it is in Romans chapter eight, I'm reading from the ESV. Again, that's listed there, but what I'm reading from is also in your comment section. And it says this, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law, and, and so uh, I'm gonna hit the pause button real quick here. He's gonna start talking about the difference between uh, law and spirit or death and life or flesh and freedom. So those are just all interchangeable words, but so don't get lost in, in that. For the law, verse two, of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus. I circle that, those three words, in Christ Jesus. He's talking to a very particular person or group of people. So he says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus. Those of you who are in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. Now, the context is so important. Paul's writing to a group of people who think that by obeying rules, by obeying the law of God, they can obtain righteousness or a right standing before God. Um, but he's saying it's impossible. It's impossible because your flesh weakens. You're just not able to do it. By sending his own son, the middle of verse three there, in the likeness of sinful flesh for and for sin, God condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So he's talking about those Christians in Christ. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, that is God's working spirit in you, that person sets his mind on the things of the spirit or the things of God. For to set the mind of the flesh, uh, or excuse me, for to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's an important thing. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you. And it clarifies who has the Spirit. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ doesn't belong to him. But... If you've received Christ, if Christ is in you, although our body, our flesh is dead because of sin, the spirit is, is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him, Jesus, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies though, through his spirit who dwells in you. Wow. Yeah, I know. Don't, don't get lost in that because I really just want to, you know, what is he saying? If I could boil it down, I would boil it down this way. God did for us through Christ, through sending Christ, what obedience to the, the rules or good living couldn't do because that's not what following the law was designed to do. What God did do for us. He did through Christ. And, and, he, and he, he makes us righteous. What did God do for us through Christ? He answers that question for us. 
What God did for us through Christ is he made us righteous. He made us, he gave us a right standing before himself. So we didn't do it. And it wasn't a payment in some way for what, what kind of person we were. Because that's that's a tripper, isn't it? We If we stop and think about it, people really think that if I live rightly, then God will have to do this for me. And then we are counting on our righteousness. And he's saying, no, you'll never be able to live that righteous to attain righteousness before God. But God did it for you through Christ. He did this by making Christ sin for us. I encourage you to write down 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that Christ took on the righteous requirements of the law that we couldn't keep. So through faith, we now belong to Christ. And he, by what he's done for us, has actually released us from what we once belonged to. And he told us in there what we belonged to. He said we belonged, we were owned, we were conquered by sin and death. That's what he says. You were destined for condemnation. That's why verse 1 is so incredible. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For everybody outside of Christ Jesus, the consequence of rejecting Christ is condemnation from God. So let's just look at that. And one of the biggest differences is what you now aim to please, right? You aim to please God instead of yourself first and foremost, anyways, God before yourself. Those who live to please themselves consistently yielding to it are actually still in bondage to it. That's what he says. So you are in bondage to sin and death in that way. So those who yield to the spirit will one day be raised to new life. That's huge. I mean, all of the things that we just did in those 11 verses, we probably just covered five sermons in a matter of five minutes. So uh, keep up with me here because we're going to get to the, 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 the real part of what we want to get to tonight. But let's read the next section. The next section is Romans chapter 8, verse 12. So then, brothers. So he, so you, when you see that word, so then, he's going to say, what is the consequence or what changes? What practical outworkings of, of what we just read do we see now? So he says this. What we find is that we're actually become debtors in debt, uh, but not to ourselves, who we were in debt to. We had to be in debt. We're, our, we were in debt to pleasing ourselves, to the flesh. But he says, we're not in debt to that anymore. But now we're, we live according to the spirit. But if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you're living. For all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you do not receive the spirit of slavery, and fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. That intimate connection we have with God through Christ. And he says the spirit of God himself will bear witness with our spirits that we are actually that, children of God. And if we're children, then we're heirs. And these, these things are just mind-blowing. We're not pulling them apart and, and dissecting these things, but he's saying that you are an heir uh, of God, a fellow heir with Christ because of what Christ has done. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let that just marinate in your brain for a second, in your heart. What he is saying about you because of what Christ did. Um, so he says our flesh, though, if, I, if we look at those verses, and we try and uh, give it a, a conclusion, we're saying that our flesh is actually an anchor that can work against the purposes of God. It can actually work against the purposes of God. So when it comes to being made right before God, the flesh is of no use at all. It's all done by God through the Spirit. So we owe the flesh nothing, right? Uh, we don't 
where it's not like we're in bondage to it anymore. We don't owe it anything anymore. We need to give it its proper burial because uh, it's our old identity. You're now a child of God. And in fact, you're being led by the Holy Spirit. And the point of that whole first half of the chapter then is this, that God through Christ has declared you and me righteous. That is justified, uh, maybe uh, right before him. Uh, I love the way John in his gospel says that you've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light in the sun. And Paul uses this reality to answer one of the most uh, important questions of maybe this time and probably one of the greatest questions in all the ages. What do we do with suffering? What do we do with hardship? What do we do with distress? What do we do in, in pandemics? Uh, Paul uses all of that reality of chapter, the first half of the chapter. That's why I couldn't just skip over it. He uses all of that reality to answer the question of suffering, of, of tribulation and distress and hardships and pandemics. How do, we, how do we balance that given God's great power? Why would God allow pandemics? What good could possibly come from suffering? Uh, you might not have seen where that was going in that first half, but let's let's break back into it. In chapter 8, verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, do you hear that? I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. So he's saying, let's put them both on the scales. That's what he's saying. Let's put the present suffering, this moment that we're in, or other moments. I mean, uh, you and I both know people who have cancer and have been diagnosed with cancer just recently or have had you know, scares and have gone to the hospital or um, people who know uh, people who have uh, this coronavirus and maybe you know someone who's passed away because of it. What do we do? So we put all of that suffering on this side of the scale. And Paul says, when you put in the other side of the scale, the glory that is coming, it's like, wham! It, it hits so hard that, that that suffering literally flies out of it. That's the picture. And he says, you got this, you put this suffering on this side of the scale. So you put it in there. And it does this with the scale, you know, it weighs. And then he says, on this side of the scale, you put in the glory that's going to be ours in Jesus Christ when he returns. And that is so incredible and so weighty that it thuds to the bottom. And as it goes so hard, the other side of the scale flings up. And, and it's like, I don't even remember the suffering anymore. But then he says, but that's not our current experience. Look at with me in verse 19. All of creation waits for eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not on its own, not because it wanted to, but because of him, God, who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but so are we. So are we groaning. And we're the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons. We know that everything isn't the way it's supposed to be, and we long for it to be the way it's supposed to be. But he says, the greatest longing that you eagerly await for is the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we are saved. We were saved. And then he says, now hope that is, is seen, you don't need hope for what you can actually see with your eyes. For who hopes for what he already sees and has? But if we hope for what we do not see, Jesus coming for his church, We'll wait for that patiently. Our present suffering 
doesn't compare with a future glory. That does not downplay the reality of our present suffering, though. So whether or not this virus, um, you know, I've heard a lot of people talking about this virus being a plague from God, a curse from God. And, it, and it's funny because um, this Sunday we're looking, we are going into the plagues in Exodus. You might want to tune in for that one and see how we can bring that to uh, some pictures for us. But so whether or not this virus is a curse from God, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to weigh in on such a matter, uh, honestly, it, because it doesn't need to be. Um, he says, first of all, creation is has been subjected to futility. And this is viruses and mutations of viruses. That's what he's talking about. The, the, the creation has been frustrated, like viruses coming as a judgment, he says, against sin, and hope that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage of corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. He says, so he's just pointing us forward all along. There are, these are, are to point our hearts towards the day when the corruptible, that is my flesh, will be made incorruptible. That's one of the things I long for the most. And as I said at the beginning, and I've just my heart has been longing for Jesus' return in the last week or two. And one of the things that I'm most longing for is to be done with this corrupted body. It's corrupted in sin and, and its decline and its decay is happening. And that's what's happening with creation all around us. But there's coming a day when that's all going to be changed, where we'll finally be free from sin and disease, where we'll be glorified. Uh, where we'll have the adoption really is the picture he says where the adoption will be finalized. I went with uh, the Boutons um, to their uh, adoption service with Gavin, my Karen and Michaela and I all went when they went before the judge at Livingston County Courthouse and adopted Gavin. And, and, and what an amazing experience that was. Uh, when the when the judge finally declared that Gavin was fully and officially a Bowton, there was an eruption of cheers and, and there, everybody was happy. There were gifts. There was applause. The judge came down and it was just really neat. And that's what he says is, is we're waiting for, for that finalized adoption that our uh, diseased bodies will be redeemed. This eternal hope, he says, is the hope of our salvation. It's a future hope, not yet quite fully realized physically and emotionally. Um, so anything or even everything combined that we may suffer in this life won't compare with the glory that's coming. It'll be like, this is a kind of a harsh thing to say, but it'll be like comparing a scoop of dog poop with a truckload of the rarest diamonds. You, you wouldn't compare those two. It's disgusting to think of a scoop of dog poop maybe, um, but he, he says the present suffering when that day comes will be like comparing a scoop of dog poop to a truckload, I mean, an 18-wheeler truckload full of the rarest diamonds. It, you, would, you would forget quickly about that tiny little poop. <laughs> That's for sure. So let's look at the next section. Likewise, the Spirit of God helps us in our weakness. So we're in this present situation where we not only have the coronavirus, but our bodies are subjected to weakness. Our bodies are still subjected to desiring sin or desiring things that are less than glorifying to God. Creation is subjected to frustration. So we're in that. But listen to this verse. I'm going to read it again because we're not in it alone. Likewise, the Spirit of God who dwells in you, uh, he helps us in our weakness. For we don't know even what we ought to pray in these things. 
but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with words that are too deep. And he who searches hearts knows what's in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes. So just go to verse 20, and we know. This is one of those verses that is like, everybody knows this verse. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. We hear that all the time. But this is where it comes from. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. For what? What did he, what did he, God ordain in advance for us to be? To be conformed into the image of his son. Now we're starting to real, if, if I were, I would say we're starting to turn the heat up and get really close to where we are getting to be able to understand what it means to be more than a conqueror. Because Paul has been moving slowly to build the foundation so that when he lays that verse on us, it's going to nail us. And we're excited about that. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that we, or that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. So let's look at this. Let's look at that verse 28 for a second, because that's such a, a well-known verse, right? That all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We, I mean, I'm, I've used it before. I'm sure you've used it before. And, and we hear that verse used all the time. But what is the good? What is the good in verse 28 that Paul is referring to? When he says that we know that all, that for those who love God, all this suffering will work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. What is the good, though, that he's referring to? He shows us two. He shows us two. In the verse one, we already read in verse 23. The first good that Paul reveals is the redemption of our bodies, the full and final adoption. You see, in God's perspective, this is the greatest good. That God is going to bring us home. That's the greatest good. And the second one is equal to it in the same way, in some mysterious way. And I say mysterious because we, we don't understand its value and importance here and now. But I want you to notice in verse 29, the good that he's referring to. Not only is he saying that it's the good is that we are going to have redeemed bodies and we will be fully and finally adopted, but there is a present thing that is equally as good that God is working to accomplish. And one of the means by which he has um, ordained to accomplish it is suffering. What's the good? To be conformed to the image of his son. That's verse 29. So when we quote that verse, that all things work together for good, we're not talking about so that things turn out easy and rosy for us. The good is the fact that I would look more like Jesus today than I did yesterday. That I would look more like Jesus tomorrow than I do today. And of course, there's lots of things that are hurdles that we need to conquer for that to happen. And that's where we're gonna now be able to move into that next section. But it's like this, think about this. It's like the suffering is working for us now instead of against us, if we'll see it. As though it's something we, you know, we think we need to pray away suffering. I think that's why he says the spirit helps us in our prayers because our flesh might want to pray away the suffering. But look at what James says in James chapter one. In James chapter one, verse two through four, James says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith, what is he doing? What is God doing? It's producing something in you. It's producing perseverance and steadfastness. And he says, let that have its full effect. Don't pray, don't pray suffering and trials away so quickly. Ask God, what are you trying to do in me through these? 
God, how are you using this suffering for your good? That's what he's, so that we would be lacking. So here's our final, here's where our final, our final verse comes in. I, I, I know that we've been, we've rushed through so much of this, but we had to kind of go through that to get to this. Uh, what does it mean to be a conqueror? And, and it would be pretty awesome if when we got to the end of this, that we could say, yeah, we are conquerors. But I want you to catch this. He doesn't say we are conquerors. He's going to say we are more than conquerors. What? What's more than a conqueror? I'm going to ask you that question in a second, so be thinking about that. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also give with him graciously give us all things? Who could bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was the one who was raised, who is at the right hand of God and is indeed interceding for us. So, in light of that, what can separate us from the love of Christ? Could tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or pandemics? As it is written, for your sake we're being killed all day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And his answer is no, no. And all these things we are, we're not just conquerors. He says we're more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, anything present, including viruses, cancer, anything, nothing, nor things to come, not powers, not height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation is going to be able to separate us from the love. Nothing can come between us and the love that God has for us. Now, he doesn't say that we are conquerors, but he says that we are more than a conqueror. So here's my last question for you. I want to just have you give you a minute to weigh in on. How can we be more than a conqueror? A conqueror, well, now I want you to, I want to pause and I want you maybe to go back and look at the answers that were given because they were good and right answers. They're victorious, they're triumphant. How can we be more than victorious? How can we be more than triumphant? Because honestly, wouldn't we be just uh, blessed? If we were able to be victorious over our sins, you know, those sins that just keep biting at our heels, <clears throat> wouldn't we be uh, thrilled if we could conquer suffering? Wouldn't we, honest, honestly though, wouldn't we be absolutely ecstatic and, and want to shout from the rooftops, praise to God, if we could be victorious over tribulation? over suffering, if we could somehow be victorious over disease, uh, we would be conquerors and that would be awesome and we would praise God. But he's saying here more than that. Here's the thing. We are more than conquerors. Um, so he ends this amazing chapter by, he's going to answer the question by asking a rhetorical question. And, and he says, so what do we say about these things? Of course, we know that by now we've been studying this chapter. We know that the, these things are the, the tribulation, the distress, the persecutions, the famine, the nakedness, the danger, the sword. So what he says, what should we say about these things? It's, isn't, it's not really a question he doesn't know the answer to. It's really, it's not something that should take us by surprise or 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 find unfitting for Christians as though believers should somehow be immune to these things. The question is, what do we do with these things? 
What do we do with tribulation, distress, persecution, uh, nakedness, famine, sword? How do we move from being a conqueror and victorious to being more than this? This is a cool thing. I want you to catch this because I think it, it completely changed the way I look at this whole chapter. So he answers the, he asks a rhetorical question and then he, he really answers his own rhetorical question by asking four more rhetorical questions. The first one was, if God is for us, who could be against us? So God is for us. That's, that's point number one. Um, then he says, if God didn't spare his own son, this is another rhetorical question, but gave him up for us all, how will he also not with him graciously give us all things? Well, what he's saying is, hey, God has already gone all in. He has committed himself to the cause. The work of Christ on the cross to redeem us is all the evidence we need that God will not be dissuaded from completing everything he has promised to complete. And then he says the third, the next rhetorical question, who could bring any charge against us? Who could condemn us? It's like he's drawing a picture of God in the courtroom of heaven and God slamming the gavel down saying, innocent. And then the last rhetorical question uh, is, what could separate us from the love of Christ? And he's answering, asking all these questions, trying to get to, to the point where he says, no, in all of these things, verse 37, 38, you're more than conquerors. I want to just listen to what John Piper says regarding this. And here's what more than a conqueror looks like. This is a beautiful picture, a beautiful picture. He says, affliction or suffering or tribulation or nakedness or famine or sword, all of these things, the, these things raised his sword to cut off the, the head of Paul's faith, right? So affliction raised its sword to cut off the head of Paul's faith. But instead, the hand of faith snatched the arm of affliction and forced it to cut off part of Paul's worldliness. Here's how you become more than a conqueror. Affliction is made the servant of godliness and humility and love. Satan meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. The enemy was suffering. We didn't just win over cancer and say, I beat cancer. No, he says, conquerors beat cancer. More than conquerors make cancer serve their purpose. Isn't that amazing? So chronic pain. Wouldn't you just love to, to um, be victorious over chronic pain, whether it's knees or hips or back or whatever? What he's saying here is the enemy, that chronic pain, became Paul's slave and worked for him an even greater weight of glory than he ever would have had without it. So the conqueror defeats the enemy. More than conqueror, not only defeats the enemy, but then subjugates it, subjects it to being its servant. That's amazing. That's amazing to me. And that just changed my whole perspective. And, I, and I'm, I'm sure that I totally botched it up. And you're not going to like be as odd about that truth as I was. But I'm asking you to just go back and look at that again and see what more than a conqueror is. More than a conqueror takes the, the suffering and says, God, you have already defeated sin, death, disease, and there's coming a day when it's going to be wiped out. Now it's conquered. By Christ, it's conquered. Now take it and use it as a servant for your purposes in me. Could you imagine um, the power ah. of, of praying that? What God could do with that heart? What God could do with that, um, that mindset that if we would just pray that prayer, God, how 
can you use this? This, whether it's chronic suffering, uh, sorry about the sunlight shining in there like that. It's kind of like doing this funky thing on the screen. But imagine if we could pray, God, would you um, use fill in the blank, be it my chronic pain, my, the suffering, use this pandemic. You've already defeated sin and disease but use it now for your glory, God. This is how Paul can say to the Corinthians, for example, thanks, honey, um, that these afflictions, he says this in, in 2 Corinthians, he says that these afflictions are light and momentary, even though what they're going through is intense and people are dying. But he says, in the light of the glory to be revealed, it's light and momentary, because as more than conquerors, we've taken the enemy of affliction and subjugated it to work for us. It's preparing us. Now we see suffering in a whole new light. We don't want it. We don't invite it. We want it gone. I get it. But we're going to say, Jesus, in your hands, you can take this virus and use it for your glory and your church's good. That's why I started what I started with. How will God move us as a church? How will God move you and I to reframe the way we look at this moment? How will God work in my heart and your heart to reframe the way you look at your chronic pain, the way you look at your cancer, the way you look at your suffering, um, the way you look at your loss. Now, these things are not easy and we don't discount them as being, oh, just don't pay any attention to them. That's not what he's saying. He's saying in the hands of God, their purpose will be to fashion you and, and remake you into his image, which is his greatest good for you. His greatest good for me and his greatest good for you is to be remade into his image. So I, I kind of chose the last song that I did.